because I fouled up the program and the people introducing me don't have any idea what I'm going to do. In fact, they haven't any idea what I did. <laughs> <laughs> Titles don't matter. I just shove anything under there I want to shove. <laughs> Archaeologists have made a rather fascinating discovery that I think is the same time quite disturbing. That is that they have discovered that the pagans, the temples that they had in the ancient Near East, designed their temples very much like the temple that uh, Solomon built at Jerusalem. The pagan temple, like that uh, temple of the Bible, had an outer court and it had an inner court. And then at the center of the inner court, there was the holy place, and then in the holy place, there was the most sacred place of all. In the pagan religion, the priest would enter that uh, most sacred place uh, once a month or four times a year, sometimes once a year. The temple at Jerusalem that is detailed for us in the scriptures also had an outer court, an inner court. It too had a uh, sacred place. And in the uh, center of that sacred place, what was called the Holy of Holies, all of the temple uh, led to that uh, inner place. Slant of the floor, the uh, cut of the doors, the uh, slant of the walls, all pointed to that place where God dwelt. The center of the pagan temple, there was a little golden god, a little golden goddess, the god of war, the goddess of fertility. The center of uh, Israel's temple, there was a golden box. It was called the Ark of the Covenant. In that uh, box, there were the tablets of stone, the inscribed law of God. At the center of pagan worship, there was a golden god or goddess. At the center of Israel's worship, it was the revealed, written, moral will of God. The difference in the worship of the pagans and the difference in the worship of Israel was not, evidently, in the design of the temple. It's probably not in the method of worship. Sacrifices were common to both. The difference was that at the center of Israel's worship, was the word of God written. That means, it seems to me, that if you and I are going to be ministers of God, one of the things that uh, we must do is to know that word. That word given to us in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, is indeed God's declared moral will. There's nothing more important than to know that word and to teach it to our people. John Stott, in his uh, very interesting book, Between Two Worlds, points out that the task of the preacher is to be a bridge between the ancient world and the modern world. The basic analogy of the book is that uh, just as you can have two land masses separated by a great ravine or by a huge river, and a bridge brings those two masses together. So you have people living in the 20th century A.D. and people who lived in the 20th century B.C. And you must bring those two together. The preacher, he says, is a bridge. That means that the shape of preaching is not a circle. A circle has a single center. The shape of preaching is an ellipse, which has two centers. Uh, to have an effective ministry of the scripture, you must be centered in the word. But also, you must be centered in men and women in the world. In order to be an effective preacher of the uh, scriptures, you must have what John Cleland calls bifocal vision. That is, uh, you have one eye on the past, another eye on the present. Uh, 
to effectively minister the Word of God, you must be an exegete of the Scriptures, but also an exegete of the congregation. So the minister stands between these two centers as the bridge that brings them together. And while I would not for a moment disagree with John Stott that we must then live between those two worlds, that we must, as Thistleton said, be people aware of two horizons, I'd suggest that uh, while we form that ministry of bridging, that you and I, as uh, teachers of the scriptures, must really be participants in several different worlds. One world in which we must enter and be a part is the ancient world. That is the world that we enter through exegesis. That world has a history. It has its own culture. It has its own language. To really understand the Bible, you must understand the history of the Bible. When God gave his revelation, he gave it to a particular people at a certain time in a definite place. And he did not repeat that revelation over and over again. Therefore, to understand that revelation, I need to be able to go back into history and see what was taking place when that word was given. There's a sense in which when you exegete the scriptures, it resembles a bit reading someone else's mail. You found a letter in an attic, and you were to read that letter, there would be certain questions that would come to you immediately. Who wrote it? To whom was it written? What was the circumstance that brought the uh, letter about? And why was this letter considered to be so valuable that uh, people kept it? And now, years later, I am reading it. If you're going to understand the major prophets or the minor prophets, you must know the history out of which they came. God gave his revelation to people in history. Secondly, as you enter into that world of exegesis, you must have some awareness, or should have some awareness, of the language. The Bible came to us in, uh, primarily in Hebrew and in Greek. And there is an advantage of being aware of those languages. Uh, one advantage is that it enables you to make judgments if you use translation. Most of us are not uh, as familiar with the ancient languages as we might like to be. And certainly none of us is as familiar with the ancient languages as we are with our own tongue, English. But when you use translations, you discover that the translator is an interpreter. The difference between translations is that this group of translators fell off the turnip truck and didn't know any better, and this was a you know, school group. Those people who have translated the Bible have probably forgotten more Greek, more Hebrew than you and I will ever know. But if you are a translator, you must be an interpreter. Because you must make judgments about the meaning of words based on the context out of which they come. You simply look up words in a lexicon and decide, oh, I like that word, I'll make that the translation. <laughs> it's to misunderstand that words are stupid things. They really don't have meanings until you see them in context. Uh, so, as you understand the uh, ancient language, you can understand some of the decisions the translator had to make. What is more, some of the ambiguity of language that you feel in English is also inherent in the original manuscripts. If you have a uh, subjective genitive, an objective genitive, Translation of that is, uh, you know, the love of Christ. The question is, is that the subject agenda? That is an object agenda. Is he saying the love of Christ, that is, Christ's love for us, or is he saying my love for Christ? Uh, now, to understand why the translator goes one way or another, or why he leaves it vague, you are helped if you have... Uh, some acquaintance, some understanding of those original languages. 
The second reason that you might want to study the languages is not only because the languages uh, give us the thought of the writer, but in turn, languages determine thought. If you want to know how people think, learn their language. Benjamin Lee Ward was a noted linguist. And he spent a good part of his life working with the Hopi Indians in the American Southwest. Worf, as a result of working with these Indians, advanced the uh, proposition that uh, language not only reflects thought, language determines thought. He goes on to say that when the theory of relativity was explained to the Hopi Indians, they understood it. <coughs> Einstein said that he could not have thought of the theory of relativity in English. In order to think of it, he had to know mathematics and German. Well, the Hobies don't know mathematics, they don't know German, but they do understand the theory. And the reason is that there is no time in the Hopi language. There's no past, no present, no future. In their language, something is either happening where you are, it's happening away from you. As a result, with that kind of grid, it's easier to understand what Einstein was getting at. You and I, if we are simply limited to English, just can't do that. The language itself causes us to think of something in the past or even in the further past or something in the present or something in the future or something in the distant future. The verbs have time bound up in them. Worf went on to say uh, that it's interesting that the, uh, the Eskimos do not have a word for snow. <laughs> they have 17 words for snow. <laughs> I mean, they've got a word for snow falling, snow hitting the ground, snow beginning to freeze, snow turning the snow turning the sea, sleet, snow melt, you know, the whole thing. That's 17. Well, you folks ought to get their vocabulary. <laughs> <laughs> when Eskimos think about snow, they can really think about snow. <laughs> But they do not have one word that covers it all. Just as uh, we don't have a single word for a bread product made from wheat. You say bread, that doesn't take in Twinkies or croissants. Uh, doesn't take in all of the varieties of uh, bread and pastry that we know. We have a number of different words to think about bread products made from wheat. In other parts of the world, in India, I'm told, they just have one word that covers the waterfront. You see, the words you have, the language you have, as a way of uh, not only revealing thought, but determining thought. So, as you study the Old Testament, you might decide that the, but the greatest passage in the Old Testament is Psalm 23. You know, you're dealing with sheep and shepherds. English says, the Lord is my shepherd, but Simon said, the Lord my shepherd. Number said one of the reasons that Semitic people use their hands a lot is to fill in the verbs. <laughs> uh, New Testament, the greatest passage is probably 1 Corinthians 13. Dealing with the abstract virtue of love. When people in the Old Testament who were nomadic thought, time wasn't that important. And uh, in the New Testament, we are dealing with uh, Greco-Roman thought. It is. The point I make is that one way of getting into that ancient world is to become aware of the language. Whereas more people in the ancient world existed within a culture. Their culture was as real to them as our culture is to us. So one of the questions you have as you study the Bible is to wrestle with the cultural problem. For instance, if you read the book of Proverbs, which really comes over rather nicely into the 20th century, you still have problems. You have problems, for example, that, that behind that book there is a monarchy. Uh, there is to be respect for the king, and certain things are said about that uh, ruling person. Is the Bible then indicating that the uh, monarchy is God's chosen form of government for everybody? Yes. <laughs> when I speak, God just speaks directly. <laughs> or, if you are, uh, if 
you are uh, reading the Proverbs, you read about the danger of co-signing a note. Uh, I mean, it is dangerous to co-sign a note in the Proverbs. <laughs> you can end up in slavery. Go to beg and plead to get out of it. No, it's not a particularly wise idea to go sign a note in Canada, but uh, very few people can end up in slavery as a result of it. There was the culture of the ancient world said that if you signed the note, you owed the debt, and if you owed the debt and didn't pay it, they could put you into slavery. In America, you just declare Chapter 11 bankruptcy and walk away from it. <laughs> the culture forces a great many of the warnings of the Proverbs. In the New Testament, you deal with something like meat offered to idols. At least in Canada and the United States, uh, unlike other parts of the world, that's not a particular problem for us. It was for them. It was a theological problem. It was a social problem. It was a psychological problem. Uh, that culture uh, made that uh, something that people wrestle with. Today, we are wrestling with the uh, place that women should play in uh, Christian ministry. One of the things we wrestle with is uh, how much of what the Bible says is uh, within its culture, how much crosses the culture, how much uh, applies only to the first century and the situation in which uh, the people found themselves, but how much of that uh, crosses the generations and is uh, an abiding word of God to enter the ancient world. You become concerned about its history, its language, its culture. But there is a second world into which uh, you and I must enter. And that's the modern world. It's the world that the communicator, the politician, is concerned about. This modern world, the world of the 20th century, also has a history, also has a culture, also has a language. We do have history. It's interesting to me that over the years, evangelicals have tried to ignore history. But history won't ignore them. History is a way of setting the agenda and raising questions we would rather leave buried. In the early 1960s, I remember a couple in Dallas coming to talk with me. He was in the medical school, and uh, he was in his third year at medical school, looking forward to a residency. And his wife discovered that she was pregnant. They came to talk to me about having an abortion. I can still remember the feelings that I had. I'd never had anyone else uh, face me, eyeball to eyeball, and talk about abortion. It was as though people sought me out to ask uh, whether or not it was right to commit murder. I was uh, repulsed. I was confused. I could feel the adrenaline pumping. 1968 in the United States, the Supreme Court made a decision. Up until that time, every state in the United States had laws against abortion. Two states, Colorado and Hawaii, allowed abortion not only if the mother's life was at stake, but if the mother's health was at stake. And they were the two liberal states. In 1968, the Supreme Court made a decision, changed the law, and ultimately, by changing the law, changed the morality of the United States. Today, uh, one child is aborted for every three that are born in our country. You know, if you speak to a congregation like this, that there are people in this congregation who have uh, some place along the way had an abortion. It is common. It is a constant discuss discussion. It's in the market. Now, it wasn't because a group of theologians got together in some city and said, look, let's uh, look this over. <laughs> history changed. <clears throat> and now history comes walking into our study. Like it or not, it wants us to face hard choices. Uh, something happened in history to the church. Up until uh, through the 1950s, church felt that it dealt with 
spiritual practice. After the 1960s, church came to believe that it was responsible for all of the people and the whole person in the community. And so uh, history forced upon the church the role of being a broad caretaker. Again, if I could use the United States as an illustration. We just celebrated the uh, birthday of Martin Luther King. I have lived long enough to have been in the southern part of the United States when there were the laws that insisted that the blacks sit in the back of the bus, so whites sit in the front of the bus. You took a bus trip from New York and you were going south when they crossed the border into Maryland or Virginia. They played the uh, fruit basket upset. All the blacks had to move to the back, all the whites. Hard to believe that. I would like to believe that the change that took place in our country took place as a result of uh, Bible teachers and theologians and seminary professors getting together and studying the book of Ephesians. <laughs> that the middle wall has been broken down and that uh, those differences that separated people are now gone and they're brought together. If a man or woman belongs to Christ, that man or woman belongs to me. I wish that the churches had taken the lead. They did. All of that changed because a black woman by the name of Rosa Parks one day decided she didn't want to move in the bus. And Birmingham felt the tremendous tension of racial struggle. And the march to Selma and Martin Luther King and the assassination and it changed. Probably nothing more shameful took place than when the blacks wanted to enter white churches. But in Baptist churches, deacons stood on the front steps and would not allow their black brethren in. That's changed. The situation is a lot better in the United States. It did not happen because we changed. It happened because history changed. And history changed and it uh, forced its agenda upon us. So the reality is that uh, we may ignore history History does not ignore us. The problem of teenage pregnancy is a major problem in the United States. With it, the problem of teenage suicide. If uh, suicide were looked at as a disease in our country, it would be the major single disease to be dealt with in the United States. If you're a pastor in our country, I suppose in yours, <laughs> You'll deal with teenage pregnancy. And you'll deal with suicide. And you'll deal with it as pastors uh, 30 years ago didn't have to deal with it. Because history has changed. And it sets the agenda. So now we're dealing with the poor. Now we're dealing with the pollution of the atmosphere. These enormous questions. And I grew up in a church that was very concerned about whether people went to movies or not. <laughs> Our church is very concerned about the length of your hair. <coughs> Reminds me of a Catholic priest who told me that he listened to the confession of nuns. It was like being stoned to death with popcorn. <laughs> <laughs> the, reason, the reason that we deal with those things is that they are manageable. Personal ethic is easier to handle. But history is bringing a new agenda to it. And the thoughtful pastor, the thoughtful Bible <coughs> In addition, we live in a culture. And again, we tend to take that for granted. Uh, this year, I have done a great deal of traveling outside the United States. Spent the summer in the Orient. Spent a couple, uh, a couple weeks ago, I was in uh, Italy. As I traveled in those areas and interacted uh, with the people and with the missionaries, what occurred to me was that uh, culture is like a piece of colored paper. In the United States, the paper over our eyes is red, the paper over your eyes is blue. In the Orient, the paper over their eyes may be green, and in uh, Africa, the paper over their eyes might uh, be yellow. 
we all look out at the same things, but we look out through this colored paper, and somehow we think what we see is what is really there. But culture always distorts it, shades it. As I traveled this uh, summer, I came to the conclusion that cultures are not neutral. I came to the conclusion that cultures are basically demonic. That when you look at what it takes to reach people in Taiwan or in China or in Japan, it is not only a knowledge of the language, it is an understanding of the culture, and you come to realize that those cultures keep people from really understanding the gospel. And I discovered coming back home to the United States after being away for quite a while, that our culture is as demonic as anybody else's culture. It has a way of uh, shaping how we look at the world, and you discover that it's the world of principalities and powers. It's what the Apostle Paul is talking about in, First Corinth, uh, in uh, Romans chapter 12, when he says, don't be conformed to this world. But the tough thing is to get that colored paper lifted. Bain, in his introduction to Martin Luther, says something like this. He says, every man or woman who has ever influenced the, the age for God has first of all been caught up in the spirit of that age and then is able to stand outside and speak a word of judgment and grace. If uh, you are kept from seeing the culture, then uh, you'll never be able to speak effectively. But the culture is there. Many of the issues that uh, we deal with in our way, the issue of music, for example, is a cultural issue. What is more, we have a language in the 20th century. It's the language of the Volkswagen ad. It's the language of uh, McCall's, of Time magazine. It's the language of the people in the marketplace. Sometimes when you get to the church, you discover we've taught the language of Zion or something. Uh, there is, as we get up to speak, a kind of stained glass voice in which we speak these sacred words. O oh God, Thou who sittest on the throne of the universe, we are grateful that we can enter your presence. Imagine that man going into a McDonald's to order a hamburger. <laughs> My friend, I would like a hamburger <laughs> with french fries and a Coke. <laughs> it's a little wonder that the people on the outside wonder who the people on the inside are. <laughs> just today doing a report looking at a study of uh, use of language and uh, one research group moved out into the uh, culture and uh, asked people to define terms like uh, Christian, born again, evangelical. <laughs> and they discovered most of the people in the society had no idea how to define those terms. Even more interesting. They found that words like sharing and fellowship turn people off. People who are not part of the church heard those words and it flipped their switches negatively. There's a language in the marketplace, language of the Volkswagen ad. We don't speak that language. We're not going to talk to this generation. And the danger is that we come up through the church and through the seminary and we have all of these marvelous words. I'm going to talk to the congregation about hematology and eschatology. <laughs> you know, they've they got to heal that. It's <laughs> <laughs> great disease after AIDS. <laughs> <laughs> there is a, a language. And if you don't learn to speak the language of the marketplace, hear what Charles Spurgeon said. 
the people in the marketplace will never learn the language of the seminary. Therefore, the seminary had better learn to speak the language of the marketplace. There is a third world into which you must enter and work. That's your particular world. That's the world where you serve God. Certainly, you need to know the ancient world, and certainly, as an interpreter of God's word to the people, you need to know the winds that blow across the society. But ultimately, that world where you serve, the world of the postal code, the world that, uh, you know, Fifth and Main, that church where you are, with your 60 or 70 or 100 or 200 people, that world, that particular world, is a world that you must be aware of. That world, too, has a history, it is a culture, it is a language. A couple of... Uh, Years ago, I uh, went to speak in Aurora, Nebraska. Aurora, Nebraska is um, right out there at the edge of the world. There's a sign that says, five more miles, and you drop it. <laughs> it's a rural area in the United States. I grew up in the city. Grew up in a tenement. All my life, I've been at home in the city. I enjoy New York, and Boston, and Toronto. I find it difficult when I'm in a rural area. I remember getting out there and saying to myself as I flopped down in my bed in the hotel, how the world did I get there? <laughs> and I got my folder out and discovered that when they invited me, the stationery said, the Greater Nebraska Evangelistic Crusade. <laughs> so I figured I'd have shot it, winning a few folks to Christ, and well, the Greater Nebraska Evangelistic Crusade had taken place in the middle of the 1950s, and they still had some stationery left. <laughs> <laughs> so what we had was a, a group of churches that were really going to have a Bible conference, and so they got together, and uh, I was tied into the drum. I didn't know these ones. Flipped on television, flipped on the news. You know the first thing they had on the news? First thing, start off, the weather report. Now, in Denver, Dallas, where I live, you know where the weather report comes? It comes before, between the hard news and the sports news. Give you a chance to go out and get a you know, drink of water between the two. It's like half the football. It's up front on the Aurora, Nebraska. The next thing they had on this news was the uh, stock reports. You know, the, what the beef was selling for, and uh, what the futures were up in, uh, in Chicago. I get up about 5.30 every morning, and uh, as I'm getting ready, uh, I flip on the radio, and on the news program, there's a 10-minute segment for the farmers. Uh, they, too, are up early, and, uh, and they talk about the price of beef. I mean, it, it's 60 cents, 65 cents. I don't know what they're talking about. Old cow for 65 cents? <laughs> I have listened to that for almost eight years. And I, I no more understand it than my wife understands football scores. I mean, she has no idea what goes on in a football game. But to the people in Aurora, Nebraska, the weather report, the cost of beef, what cattle are selling for, crucial information. Then you can come on and talk about what happened over in the Far East. If you're going to minister in Aurora, Nebraska, you've got to know this. You better know what the cost of grain is. You better know what's going on when uh, they have to sell the apples. If you don't know that, you can't minister to them. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what they are? <laughs> we just give them away in our country. <laughs> get milk from a cow, we get it from a cart. <laughs> <laughs> That's a culture. Uh, that culture where you live has a language. Just as, uh, as I've been speaking in these days, aside from the New York accent, I'm sure that uh, those of you who are Canadians say to yourself, aha, it's 
not the right word. I happen to say postal code. I could have said zip code. I would have given it all away. We don't have zip codes up here. You know? I heard a speaker from Britain just a short time ago you know, giving an illustration about baseball. It was good stuff, but <laughs> he talked about somebody who made a four base hit. <laughs> I knew what he meant. Talked about a home run. Sucked it out of the park. But his language gave it away. It's a little, gave it away. He really did not know baseball. If he did, he wouldn't have said that. You don't know the language of the people to whom you're speaking. You better learn it. And until you learn it, they really won't hear what you have to say. The place that you're ministering in has a history. <laughs> when I was teaching in Dallas, we had a young man in our department who, for his uh, project, wanted to do a history of the church he was serving in in uh, East Texas. As far as I know, he's the first student that ever wanted to do that, so we let him do it. <laughs> found some interesting things. He discovered that in the turbulence of the 60s and the racial strife, a black man had uh, apparently raped a white woman. The vigilante committee had gotten hold of him, doused him with gasoline, and set him on fire on the lawn of that church. And he died there. Early 70s, the church had had a split. In that town, when the church split, everybody split. There was a division between uh, brothers, between parents, children, businesses split. There was a whole lot of things that had gone on in that history. And here this student had uh, been there for eight or nine months. When he went out to visit, to invite people to come to the church, folks in the town remembered what happened in the 60s and the 70s. That's why when you go to a church and you're new and you know you want to change the world and you're going to get this group moving again. And they don't move. One reason is they've got a history. One history is they've had ten young bucks like you in since the <laughs> church started. Everybody came in with enthusiasm and their ministry was to douse them. You know. Uh, <laughs> even more they got things in place. And they've been doing that for a long time. You look at it as a tradition, stuck in the mud. For them, it's a part of the history. Interesting that some of the folks in the church growth uh, movement say that you have to be in a church five years to understand that church. That is to understand its history. <laughs> the bad news is that pastors, on the average, change churches every two and a half years. It indicates that many never understood the people, never really entered in to where they were, what they did. So even though you must know the ancient world, the modern world, that world that God has given you, where you live and serve, is a world that you must know in its tears, its fears, accomplishments, it's hard at it. So it's very difficult to minister the word. There is a fourth world that is easily overlooked. Not only the world of, ancient, of the ancient world that you enter by exegesis and the modern world, the homiletics, particular world that you enter through your experience as a preacher. But the fourth world is this world represented by these figures in the center. And that is your world. You see, you have a history. You come out of a culture. You have a language. And interestingly enough, often when we study the Bible, when we look at the world today, when we even minister to people, the one person that we forget to look at 
is the person doing the looking. Uh, you have a, uh, a history. You grew up in a certain place, <laughs> a family. You might have been sexually molested as a child. You might have been dearly loved. You might have been a first child, a second child, a third child. You might have had sibling rivalries. <laughs> All kinds of things. You had a history. You came out of a culture, a culture that, that put that paper over your eyes. You go to school, and a bit of the paper gets torn away, but it's still there. You have a language, a language that you speak, a language that you speak to yourself. And you bring all of that to bear so that when you study the Bible, you study the Bible. You, with the grid that has been made out of the history, out of the culture, out of the language. And so what you see in the Bible is certainly part of what you bring to the Bible. You, it's not neutral. I'm convinced that while we want our theology to shape us, what we are has a lot to do with the theology we choose. I think if I were to give people an MMPI, a Minnesota Motophagional Personality Inventory, that I could, if I gave that to a group, pick out of the group the extreme Calvinist or the extreme Arminian. But extreme Calvinist, I'm not talking about somebody who believes in the five points of Calvin. I'm talking about the kind of person who, if you're with them for uh, 30 minutes, got to talk about sovereign grace. Anytime they evaluate a church, whether or not they're straight on total depravity and uh, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, they got that now. Very strong. Or, uh, you know, I think that by looking at that, I can tell you the people who would gravitate towards the great truth of Calvin. I think I can tell you the people who, if they were strong Arminians, chose that. There are often people who uh, are motivated by punishment, motivated by the, the fear of uh, not doing right. As a result, that infinitude that is God somehow appeals to them. So, when we go to the Bible, we bring to the Bible a great deal of our own personality, and often we misinterpret the Bible. Because uh, of what we are. I grew up in the ghetto of New York City. In an area called Mousetown. An area that Rita Dyer said back then was the toughest section in the United States. It was an area with uh, urine in the halls and garbage in the street. Broken glass. And broken hearts. There are two doctrines that hold me. One doctrine that holds me, and I believe to the core of my being, is the depravity of man. I believe all of us are depraved. I believe everyone suffers from a curvature of the soul. I believe that <laughs> evil is just part of us. I, I sometimes get with folks who have a more liberal bent who obviously didn't grow up in the ghetto. And, uh, <laughs> and we discuss the property. They don't believe in the property. They believe the folks are essentially good. And I don't even know how to engage in the discussion. <laughs> it seems to me, if you don't believe in the property, you don't know yourself, you don't know mankind, you don't know what's going on out there. I don't know how you can argue. It's the best proved doctrine of the Christian faith. Look at my own life, I doubt that there's ever been a time when I've done anything out of a completely pure motive. Not as bad as I could be, but, you know, everything's polluted. Uh, I believe it. It's a great, great event when you're the president of the school. <laughs> you never take it by surprise. <laughs> One doctrine that holds me is the doctrine of depravity. The other doctrine that holds me is the grace of God. I don't think you'd understand grace unless you understand the practice. Amen. But when you understand them both. I have a, a friend who told me that, 
who was going through a, a, an emotional breakdown, lived under a depression. And he told me that uh, several years ago, he lived out in, in Texas, uh, and he was going through this. One Sunday afternoon, he went to his uh, back porch and sat there. And his wife had a flower garden, and the day before, she'd had somebody come in and dump a load of manure on that uh, flower garden, fertilizer. So he said he sat there looking at the flowers and <laughs> and suddenly he said it dawned on him that God is always growing roses out of manure pots. <laughs> That's great theology. Your choice in life is whether or not you're going to smell the manure or smell the roses. And they're both there. God's always growing roses out of the pocket. There is the depravity of man, there is the grace of God, there is, his, uh, there is his general grace to all people, his specific grace to believers, but always God is working in people's lives. I believe it. Because I do, that's the way I read the Bible. The danger is that I need some other folks to say, wait, there's some other doctrines in there. So look at this another one. Those doctrines just come out again and again. <laughs> Others see the Bible and see insights into the Bible I don't see. But you bring yourself to it. You bring your history, you bring your culture, you bring your language to the church. <laughs> so the way you preach is already set before you get to seminary. Take a course in homiletics. And often the attitude you have to your congregation, it has nothing to do with the Bible, or even them. It has to do with you. There are those people who say they have a prophetic ministry. Usually folks who are ticked off at the world. <laughs> <laughs> and they can get up in the pulpit and tell the world to go to hell, but they won't tell people face to face. You can see people angry when they preach. And not, not the truth is made of angry. They're just angry people. They're dour souls. And they got ordained to do this work of God. <laughs> <laughs> you take a passage like the first Peter chapter one. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has begotten us to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, that fadeth not away, that's reserved in heaven for you, or kept by the power of God. That passage is brimming with hope, filled with joy. You know what he does with it? It's up there and says, You don't have that hope, do you? <laughs> <laughs> you don't have that joy. Man, going to church is a drag. Because every time he gets hold of a passage, he fills it with guilt. So going to church is a guilt trip. They, they got the bar up, and I managed to jump the bar, and the guy says, I've got it higher. <laughs> I don't know a whole lot about life. I do know this about being an administrator. you got to spend your life finding or catching people doing something right rather than doing something wrong. I know this about kids. You've got to give them ten out of boys for every you jerk. And you get that turned around and give them ten you jerks for every out of boy, you'll destroy your kids. You come to a congregation, and because of your background, you find it very difficult to compliment them, to praise them, to applaud them, to see what's going on that's good. Every time you look at the cans in the road, there are nine straight and one wrong, and you preach about the one that's wrong. You'll destroy a congregation. You'll make them angry, hostile. But that's not because the Bible's that way. Because you're that way. You don't know yourself. You get off on these hang-ups. Before I went to the seminary, the president, I took a battle of psychological exams. Didn't know who I was, I thought I'd find out. <laughs> the great thing about psychological exams is you really don't discover new stuff. 
I mean, I knew for years I wanted to murder my wife, but I found it out. <laughs> you, don't, you don't discover it. What you discover is that it brings into focus what you are. But you don't sit there and say, oh, I didn't know that was there. I discovered things that have been tremendously helpful to me. Look, just for instance, <laughs> my basic approach in life is to be a people person. I like people. My fallback mode is to be goal-oriented. Now, where I'm sick is that normal people, when they become goal-oriented, the people orientation goes down. Mine stays up there. So I've got this people orientation, I've got this goal orientation, both going. Constantly. So imagine that Principal McRae comes to dinner. Business. I got an article to complete for Christianity today. He's going to be there all week. He comes by, he says, look, uh, why don't we have lunch? I say, look, I've got, I've got this article. He says, fine, I'll be here all week. Why don't we do it later in the week? So he leaves. You know what happens to me? I go back, <laughs> start on that article, and I think, you know, Andrew was kind to of me when I was up there in the old country. I, I <laughs> I should have done out with it. I really should have sh put this. I should have gone out. I sit there and I can't get this thing done. But you know what happens if I go out? With it? I sit there and get an article. It's over with. I got to go back in there. I'm caught in that. So I arrange my office to keep me from getting caught in it. You know, just to show you how it works. He has been my savior these last three years. I'd stand here all night and talk. <laughs> you know, except that I go home dre. If he didn't come over and get me out of that crowd, I'd stay and talk. You know, people. But I have had a report I have to do for my trustees. And, and when I'm talking sometimes, you know, after the service. And by the way, keep talking. I don't, you know, I've learned a lot. Of but I think, look at that report. <laughs> it's going through my head. To have that pointed out to me as a tension has helped me to arrange my life. I learned other things that I'm not going to tell you about. <laughs> <laughs> well, I say what to say something. <laughs> but to know that, to recognize that ministry is the minister, the person. And that often when we think we are proclaiming God's word, we're simply telling people about our culture, our background, our history. And we can often destroy people because of who we are. Standing there preaching in the name of God our particular hangouts. Those are the worlds. When you are really an expositor of the scriptures, you bring every discipline you know to it. You have to know the Old Testament, New Testament, you have to know some church history which is interpreted as I have to know theology. You don't want to go it alone. You want to see how all of this will fit together. Now, you need to know something about education, something about communication, something about counseling. In fact, sometimes, when you look at all of it, it's like the centipede that looked at his hundred legs and wondered how he walked and never walked again. <laughs> There is an enabling power of God to a man, a woman, that wants to love God with heart, and soul, and strength, and mind. So that somehow it comes together. And you can move among God's people and reach out and take the world of the Bible with its uh, revelation and bring it to bear on the world of your people. And you act as a bridge which brings God to men and women and men and women to God. When that happens, it's worth the sweat. 